Good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much for having me, and I will also apologize for presenting in English, uh, my only poorly spoken language. Uh, can we bring up my deck? I am prepared for this. <laughs> so uh, I am the executive director of Quad9, uh, so it is a very DNS-filled day here today. Um, and I think we've got one more uh, DNS presentation, and then I hopefully a, a very good presentation or a roundtable on this. Um, so the brief introduction of Quad9. Um, uh, we were founded in 2016 as a not-for-profit organization uh, with the intention of providing secure and private DNS services uh, at high performance. So those are our three goals. It's security, privacy, and speed. Um, so we were founded by a combination of several different uh, organizations. Uh, our primary sponsors are Packet Clearinghouse, who is another non-for-profit. Um, we are located, as an example, in Packet Clearinghouse's facilities at the SOX. Thank you very much. Uh, so we do have facilities here. Um, our other sponsors were Global Cyber Alliance, um, who, were, uh, who were chartered to help internet security. And then the last one is IBM. Uh, IBM helped us with getting the address space 9.9.9. So... Am I, am I on? Am I good here? Okay, great. Awesome. Um, so uh, we are a not-for-profit based in the U.S., so uh, we take no money for our services. All of our services are absolutely free to anyone who wants to use them, whether you're an organization, an individual, a university, a municipal government. Um, and then uh, we provide DNS services over all of these standard protocols, so we support uh, standard DNS, of course, uh, and then DOH and DOT, as you've heard about, and I'm sure we'll talk more about some of these and uh, the pluses and minuses in our panel. Um, also, like Google and like most of the other major resolvers like Cloudflare, we are now validating, strictly validating DNSSEC on our primary addresses. So this is helping the security of the DNS by providing answers that are actually being generated by authoritative servers. Um, and then the question of why is there another, uh, why another recursive resolver? Um, again, the not-for-profit component is a major, comp major reason for why we exist. Um, the primary recursive resolver operators are typically your ISP. Um, they, they usually provide that at no cost. But the centralized systems, um, those are for-profit companies uh, whose reasons for providing DNS are often, whether directly or indirectly, rooted in uh, making money off of end users, and that is not our goal. Um, we deploy our servers to uh, a larger number of endpoints in the emerging world, um, so Africa, um, Southeastern Asia, Central Asia, uh, and also uh, uh, to many of the IXs located worldwide. We are in 146 locations now, I think. I'll have a map of that in a few minutes. Um, so why would you use Quad9 versus your ISP? Um, Quad9 on its primary addresses, which are the ones that everyone remembers, which is 9.9.9.9, we operate a security service on that uh, IP address. So it's a block list. If you're familiar with the term RPZ or RPZ, um, we collect threat information from a number of different providers, and we will block connections to malicious hosts. So malware distribution, botnets, uh, phishing sites, DGA, et cetera. Um, we also, uh, as far as user privacy goes, we do not resell or retransmit that data. So providing user privacy is another reason that people will convert to Quad9 for both their individual use as well as their organization. Um, from a privacy and security perspective, uh, perspective rather, um, we are located typically in IX locations with Packet Clearinghouse. Um, so one of the components you get along with our not reselling IP addresses or not reselling user data is that Quad9 is directly adjacent to about, I think it's 500 TLDs, including uh, Serbia, as an example. So we are in the same rack, we're in the same space as those authoritative servers. So a lot of what the DNS leakage is that people are concerned about these days is leakage of DNS data back through all the way up to the roots where people can analyze individual queries and try to determine what's being looked up. Um, by using Quad9, we reduce that risk 
Uh, we do queue name minimization, meaning that we don't actually send the entire name of the query all the way out to the recursive resolver, or sorry, the authoritative resolvers, except for the authoritative resolver that is directly responsible for that particular portion of the name. Um, and again, because we're adjacent to so many top-level domains, um, the queries don't leave our rack for in, the, in a large portion of the cases. Um, so Quad9 was designed to be adherent to GDPR regulations. The way that we solve this is different than a lot of other organizations that run recursive resolvers. We never store any information about end users in our platform at all. So uh, this has actually been a kind of a challenge for us in trying to get GDPR approval because the answer of we don't store any PII is not a concept that they're familiar with. They're familiar with, okay, you store PII, but how do you store it? And what's the process you go about revealing it? Whereas our answer is we never store it. The only time that we have the IP address is the amount of time that it takes to collect the query and respond to it, and then we discard it. There are some exceptions for um, denial of service attacks, but that's also called out in the GPR as being a legitimate thing to do. Um, we actually don't want all of your queries. This is also unusual. Um, there are companies these days that will actually pay ISPs for their DNS query stream. And that is for the purposes of both generating marketing information, um, sometimes it's generating security information. Um, we actually don't want the entire query stream at all. We would prefer, if you're an ISP or if you're a, a university or if, even if you're a home user, that you run a small caching forwarding resolver in your network and you simply forward the first queries out to us. And then we'll tell you whether it's a malicious or not by answering with an NX domain or answering with an actual address. So we don't want to see every query from your internal users or your ISP users. We just want to see the first one so that we can give you the answer whether this is malicious or not malicious. Um, this increases performance because your cache is typically inside your AS or even inside your local LAN. Uh, it improves user privacy because we don't see those end queries. And it also allows you as the operator then to ad add additional layers of policy on top of that. If you want to block on certain content, you're able to do that locally. If you want to want a, DO, a DOE server inside your network, we encourage you to do that, but then forward the queries out to us on that first request. Um, there are also some other things you can do if you run a recursive resolver or forwarding resolver inside your network where you can actually have some load sharing and load shedding capabilities. So if you don't trust the centralized model where the one provider is your upstream, uh, or one company is your upstream, you could configure it so that you actually shed that load or share the load across multiple providers. Um, we, we're not interested in being or having all of your query data. Um, there is a, uh, Quad9 actually offers several different flavors of service. Um, the way we do that is that you can query different IP addresses on our network to get different results. The primary one that everyone remembers is 9.9.9.9. That kind of has all the full set of things that you want on it. It has DNSSEC, it has our block list, it has queue name minimization. There are other IP addresses that you can use on our network that will give you more or less features. If you use 9.9.9.10, as an example, um, there's no DNSSEC on that. There's no block list on that. So that acts as a very dumb resolver, so you can look up things to see if they're being blocked by us or not. Or it's basically, it's a test server. You get less security, um, but you get a more open resolution path. We also offer ECS, and this is relatively new. Um, if you have a CDN provider that's inside of your ASN, some CDN providers um, use a feature in the DNS called ECS, or eDNS Client Subnet. It actually, um, we don't like uh, e ECS from a privacy perspective because what ECS does is it includes the first three octets of your IPv4 address in the DNS query to the authoritative server, allowing the authoritative server to make a, dis a decision on what AS and what CDN server they're gonna try to connect you to. If you have a CDN service like Akamai inside your network, ECS might be something you're interested in. We do offer that, again, on a different IP address, so 9.9.9.11. If you use that, you get DNSSEC, the block list, um, and ECS. Um, so there are a variety of different things we have that, are, that we offer on the network as far as flavors. You can go to the Quad9 website to get the full list and what the upside and downside is of each. ECS isn't great because 
we have to cache all of the additional data. So you, you, every user on your network, if they're in a different slash 24, as an example, may get a different DNS response back from the CDN provider. So instead of one answer being cached, you might have 20 answers that are being cached. And so that costs a lot more in memory. Um, therefore, we've had to, we, we say that ECS is going to typically give you slower responses because for the same cache size, the same memory footprint, we have uh, fewer users that can fit into that effectively. Whether your end users notice the speed difference or not is a relative question. Um, most don't. In very, very large cities like um, London or Frankfurt, that actually might make a difference. Here uh, in Serbia, I suspect it wouldn't make much of a difference at all. Most of those memory uh, questions would be answered by the servers we have. Um, so what isn't Quad9 is actually just as important a question about what it is. Um, some of the things we don't do, um, we're not a complete security solution. Um, the, the discussion from George about, about what Quad9, uh, or sorry, what Cisco does, where they do evaluations and try to figure out all these different sites that are doing malware or they're doing phishing or doing uh, homogly or homoglyphs. Um, Quad9 doesn't do that. What we do is we relay information from threat intelligence providers. We're essentially, if you want to think about it, as we are the electric lines, but we don't actually make the generator at one end and we don't make the light bulb at the other. We simply transmit the information from an existing set of threat intelligence providers. Right now we have 19 different threat intelligence providers that gives, give us these lists of malware sites. We put it into our version of the DNS and then relay it to the end user. It's a very, very hard problem to solve. Um, doing these, uh, building these malicious lists is an extremely difficult and precise science and there's a lot of work that goes into that. And we have determined that the best way to do that is to combine the information from a number of different commercial and non-commercial sources into a single path. And I'm very interested to talk more in Cisco to see if we can include them in the near future as well. Um, but uh, some of our partners include uh, ThreatStop, ThreatConnect, IBM, uh, OpenFish. Uh, we've got, uh, I think, 15 or 16 others that we combine the data from. Uh, so it is a, it is a blended uh, threat list, which is actually, in many cases, at least as effective, if not more than effective, than some of the better single lists. Um, we don't do content policing. We don't actually filter based on ideas. We only filter based on end user harm. So uh, we don't do parental control. Um, we don't do gambling uh, filtering. So if an enterprise wants to do those things, again, we suggest that they put a resolver at the edge of their network, implement those things inside that resolver, and then forward us the queries. So we are strictly uh, trying to prevent user harm, end user harm, and end network harm, not content filtering. Um, we don't have uh, again, other things that we're not, we're not a CDN, we're not a marketing company. We have no other products. There's nothing we're trying to sell at the end of the day with Quad9. We're trying to give away the service so there is no hidden uh, agenda that we have. There's no hidden for-profit motive that we have. It is entirely uh, a, a not-for-profit enterprise. Um, also, some of the things you lose with Quad9 because of our privacy constraints, there's no reporting. Quad9 simply provides blocking, and we're very, very good at that. If you want to know exactly what was blocked and who inside your network got blocked by it, that's not something we can provide because we don't store any of the information about that. We don't store information about your end users. Um, so again, if you're looking for that, we advise that you put a forwarding cache at the edge of your network and you implement those kind of solutions in that. If you're looking for advanced versions of that, then we'll forward you to someone like uh, IBM or Cisco or one of our other threat intelligence providers. That's typically um, what the, the, the business customers are looking for. ISPs pot potentially are looking for less of that. Uh, individuals are typically looking for that on a very, very limited uh, basis. They're not. They're not particularly interested in knowing what threats they've had. They're interested in having them stopped, and that's really all they care about. Um, we're not an antivirus program, so we can only block on DNS. We can't base uh, our blocks on any kind of full URL path or any kind of binary examination. It's just DNS. Um, right now, we're in 146 locations. I'm going to get into a little bit more of the technical details. Um, we're in 88 nations. Um, and I think we added one since I put this slide together. I think we added Burkina Faso two days ago. Um, so we're constantly expanding. 
Um, right now, we are located primarily with Packet Clearinghouse. Again, they're another not-for-profit, but we're expanding that footprint into other uh, hosting providers as well as into ISPs uh, who are interested in hosting our services. Um, one of the things I want to talk about a little bit today is how Quad9 differs because of our IX model versus a transit model. Uh, again, I mentioned that we're in SOX right now. So uh, to give you an example, we, uh, we have most of our traffic delivered to us via direct or one-hop direct peering versus buying transit. So uh, because we're at IX locations, um, we have a significant uh, uh, amount of interconnections with all of the members of the IXs, especially if there's a route server. Um, again, that's kind of the model here uh, in, in uh, Serbia. Um, we find that keeping the traffic local, keeping it in country, makes a big difference. If you're buying transit, often your traffic will go out of the country boundaries, which exposes it to potentially interception or at least observation by third parties. We're really trying to keep the traffic as local as possible to the end users. Therefore, we're distributing it at the IX locations. Um, the, uh, the advantages there are the space and power uh, for IX locations are often, uh, if, if not as good as, better than hosting providers or ISPs where there is sometimes uh, uh, less stable network conditions. The, the, some of the downsides with the IX model are that um, in certain countries where uh, um, there are large monopolies or semi-monopolies, it's very difficult to get IX interconnections at no cost. Um, they'll demand transit uh, pricing. They'll, they'll, in other words, they'll try to force us to buy transit. Um, so there are some countries where we have poor connectivity. Um, the one that keeps coming to mind is Australia. I'm not sure if any of you know anything about Australia, but there are a few incumbents there that don't peer at all. So our traffic from Sydney for about 40% of the user population will actually go to either Singapore or Los Angeles. Or, yeah, Singapore or Los Angeles. Most countries, however, have a very robust IX structure. So this works out, as I said, for about 80% of our traffic right now is directly peered, and only about 20% is transit. We have, I think, 12 different cities now worldwide that are, that are in the transit model. Um, here's actually a snapshot of SOX. This is what percentage breakdowns look like for traffic that we are transmitting across the IX uh, in city. So uh, this is actually a very interesting one because we had a, a very large ISP convert over to us. Um, they're actually, that blue section represents uh, their forwarding recursive resolvers turning on overnight. You can see exactly when they turned on. Um, so they're now the majority of our traffic. Um, but then there are about 30 other ASs that are sending us traffic here in, uh, uh, at the SOX. Um, we track statistics on a uh, per AS basis, so we can tell how many queries are coming from an AS, but we don't actually track the queries themselves. I can't tell you that a particular query came from a particular AS or a particular IP address because we don't track any of that data. Um, a little bit about our peering and network. As I said, we're mostly with PCH AS42 uh, is our transit provider or our hosting provider for the network. Um, again, because they're a not-for-profit, they have the same goals as we do. Um, we also provide, if you're an ISP or a network service provider, we can provide you with an instance to put inside your network. So this is something that's relatively new for us. If you have an, a large enough customer base who has an interest in Quad9, or if you have an interest in deploying Quad9, we can deliver an instance to you either at a low cost or at no cost, uh, where we put a one use server in your network to keep traffic even more local. Um, we can provide also some minimal reporting on that as well, uh, really just volume counts. So if you don't want to run a recursive resolver yourself, Quad9 can do that for you. Depending on the circumstances, there's either a very small fee, um, two or three hundred dollars US, uh, or there's no fee, depending on whether you can provide us transit or not. Um, what do we use? Um, we are uh, entirely open source based, but we are entirely redundant. In fact, we're sometimes triply redundant. Um, all of our platforms right now use a combination of PowerDNS Recursor, Unbound, and Bind. Actually, PowerDNS Recursor and Unbound take most of the queries. Bind right now we're using just for ECS. We'll probably expand that in the future. All of these are both load shedding and load sharing. So uh, any one of them, you, know, you have a random chance of getting any one of the two. Uh, and then if one has a fault, you'll automatically be converted to, to the other. This has actually saved us on a number of occasions where we found bugs 
in one of the two packages that have caused uh, outright faults. But for the user community, they didn't notice because we automatically fail over to the other. Inside of each location, we operate multiple servers. Um, those are virtual servers in some cases and physical servers in others. So we use ECMP to just deliver the traffic across those multiple servers. So we're redundant at the software layer, meaning the recursive resolver layer. We're redundant at the virtual machine or the machine layer or and, and the hardware layer. And then we're using Anycast so that even if an entire city is taken offline, queries will automatically get routed through VGP to the next available city. So uh, we've had, to this point, we've had 100% availability from a global perspective. There have been local outages, but those are typically things like um, uh, somebody routes, accidentally routes inside their network 9.000 or 9 slash 8. Um, and those are typically quickly resolved because user community complains and fixes the issue. Uh, and then we're running also, sorry, I forgot to mention this, we're running CentOS and Ubuntu as well. So in case there's a security or a, a reliability problem in either one of those two, we have redundancy at that level. So it's extremely difficult for the network to be uh, rendered unavailable due to problems. Um, and the way that we solve the other issue, and there's, I think there's going to be a discussion a little bit about DDoS, is that um, by increasing the number of locations and having a large amount of transit volume, that's really the only effective way to um, solve the DDoS problem at scale, is you simply have to be bigger than it. You can't ultimately fix DDoS. You have to simply absorb it. So by increasing the scale of the network and increasing the number of sites, um, that's how we're, that's the primary way that we solve DDoS. There are, of course, a number of other uh, techniques that we can use to absorb the DDoS at the DNS server level where we sometimes will absorb connections, not respond to them, or convert to TCP. Um, and that's a much more, that's a, that's a talk in itself. Um, finally, uh, how can you help or how can you participate so we're constantly looking for partners who can provide us new threat intelligence information. Um, that's, our, that's our primary uh, value proposition for most people is the threat intelligence. Um, we are looking for additional partners for sponsorship. Um, we are not for profit. We do get uh, contributions from individual users, but primarily our contributions are from people in the threat intelligence community, in the financial services area, and uh, in the general internet stability world. So we're looking for additional uh, uh, sponsors in that area. Um, and then uh, researchers, uh, we are uh, open to having research projects using whatever the data is that we do collect, uh, the anonymized or the, I guess the, the no PII data. Some people find that extremely interesting for research projects in university and internet studies area. Um, and then, uh, oh, if you operate a CDN, uh, get our egress IP address list so users don't have to use ECS because ECS is pretty terrible. Um, and I think that wraps it up. Thank you.